Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have Dr. Ashley Pokler here today, and she is just amazing. She is a licensed psychologist, and she is really into helping individuals. And today, she wants to go over self-care. She's working right now on completing her self-care workbook and helping others just get through life and using different techniques that are more effective than the normal techniques that you see a lot of times on the internet. So she's going to go over some of that today, and she's going to show you how you can exemplify self-love to yourself and how it can make a huge impact in the world around you. So Ashley, like always, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Tell everybody a little about yourself and, and what you do. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here again. Um, I, as you noted, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, mostly focusing on children and adolescents. But in this world, when you work with children and adolescents, you also work with all the systems that engage with those children and ad adolescents. So I tend to work with families, um, with caregivers, with therapists, with schools, um, and really just looking at it um, holistically. How can we best help kids? And the reality is we best help kids when we ourselves are in a good place. 100%. I think it's so important to be able to, um, you know, show self-love on our, you know, and demonstrate it on ourselves. A lot of people have a hard time. And I know that you were talking about earlier, there, there are more effective ways than just going into a bathtub and putting salt water, you know, in the bathtub and just relaxing, because you made a very good point. You said, you know, at, you know, at that point, it's going to help you temporarily. But then when, you know, you leave that bathroom and you start going back to the real world and you start, you know, doing your your daily chores or, you know, going back to your work and, and you know, taking care of the children or your partner, you know, all those things that are, you know, building up inside you are just going to pop right back up because they're not healed. So maybe you can, you know, go over some of the ways that we can exemplify self-love and self-care and how we could actually make a substantial change in our lives by doing so. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times the way that we talk about self-care in today's world, it really is a, a buzzword today where people take that, that day off work for a mental health day or the baths and those kinds of things that are self-soothing and self-soothing activities are a form of self-care, um, but they're just one piece of a larger puzzle to creating a space where you're really building resilience so that when things get hard, when things get overwhelming, your baseline's already at a good place. Um, and then you have those extra interventions to deal with when things get too much. And so part of self-care is that healthy baseline, getting enough sleep, getting enough water, eating healthily, um, spending time outdoors, getting some of that sunlight, um, getting those natural endorphins flowing through your body, um, through that sunlight, through uh, meaningful interactions with people that you love or that you care about, um, and through moving your body. So just healthy living in and of itself is a form of self-care and and the purpose of it is not to fix it when things get too much it's to set yourself on a space where your baseline is lower which means that you can handle stresses normal everyday stresses more effectively um, the baths the things that feel good eating your favorite food eating that piece of chocolate drinking that coffee or that glass of wine all of those are a type of self-care. They're a distraction and or self-soothing, um, but they don't make the problem go away. And so the other parts of self-care, things like mindfulness, um, like creating a safe space in your mind, um, things like living your values purposefully, um, those things help you in those moments of, okay, I feel it coming up. I have that self-awareness. I know when I'm starting to feel stressed and I'm going to use these interventions beyond the healthy living to bring my, my, my temperature down so that I can face this challenge and solve the problem. It's not just about running away from the things that are harmful. Self-care is about putting yourself in an emotional space where you can fix or solve or find solutions in other places to what's causing you the stress. I love it. You know, it, it's so true. Yeah, you know, and it, you know, I just went to a Red House uh, Wellness Retreat, and everything you just talked about is what they did. They changed people's um, eating habits. Everyone, they made sure everyone got enough of sleep. There was hiking. There was walking. You know, getting out into nature, really feeling the grounds. 
and being able to really go over, you know, deep down inside, I think everybody carries, you know, these, these repressed emotions. And we don't, we don't really always take time to tap into what's the true cause? Why am I feeling these emotions? Is it something going back further into my life? Or is it something that just recently happened? You know, and, and if it is like, what is it and how can I fix it? So after spending a week there and doing everything you just mentioned, it was like a life changing experience. I came home, feeling so different and I actually felt healthier I you know I, I felt a, an energy that I haven't felt in a while I felt you know even my gut felt better like you know everything just seemed like it was healing just by changing my lifestyle and just taking time out for me to do the things that I need as a human being yeah that's the beautiful thing about if you have the time to do a true reset to be able to get yourself to that nice calm space and that that nice baseline and then bring it into the real world and the reality is nobody does that reset and then comes and incorporates everything that they learned it really does become which self-care strategies which well-being strategies resonate the most with you and are ones that you can use regularly. Um, what happens with the brain when we feel stressed, this is how I explain it to kids, so excuse me for like the low level, um, but basically this is our brain and this part down here is like the survival mode and this part up here is this part of our brain, the thinking, the decision making, the problem solving. When we feel stressed, our, our lid flips. And the thinking part goes away and all we have left is survival. And so if we're not using those self-care strategies um, purposefully, when we first start to feel a little stressed or a little overwhelmed, we're not thinking about them. I mean, in all honesty, I spent the last week training um, 30 plus social workers and caseworkers in Uganda who deal with gender and sex and gender-based violence situations. Um, and I was training them on all of these self-care techniques and we practiced the guided imagery and we talked about happy memories. And then I got home and my kids were arguing and they were fighting and they were being disrespectful. And not once did I use any of the 50 pages of self-care activities that I had told all of these caseworkers to use because I, I missed that window of I'm starting to, but still able to think a little bit before I got to this point. Right. And I think it's so easy to go into like, you know, um, into that survival mode because, you know, with the world, the way it is, we all have obstacles, we all have challenges and, you know, life sometimes can get chaotic for many people and, you know, you automatically, you know, people tend to lose it very quickly. But if, if you start to show and exemplify self-love and, and you want to try to change the way you deal with things, so you don't go into that survival mode and you're able to really you know, think about the situation and let go and be able to handle life in a happy, productive way. What are some of the tools or things that you would, you know, incorporate? Like, you know, like step one, what are some things that people could start changing in their lives? Yeah. Um, so what I have found is that self-care is incredibly individualized it's not as simple as you have a headache cool take Tylenol it works for everybody the same way uh, wow. self-care is very different what helps me come from here back down is going to be different than what helps you is going to be different than what helps each of the listeners um, so there's it really is about trying out the entire toolkit and picking and choosing which ones resonate the most with you, which ones make you feel better. Um, for example, when I was doing this training, we did two different activities. Um, they get to the same feeling, but people either loved one and hated the other or vice versa. Um, so we were looking at ways to um, bring, bring a child or self out of that place of stress. Um, and one of them, and, and those of you listening can do this as I'm talking about it as well, is to come up with a happy memory, something that when you think about it, it makes you smile. Just close your eyes if you feel comfortable and sit in that memory. And as you're sitting in that memory, think about what you were thinking, what you were feeling, um, what, what the environment was like, what was going on inside of you, and then tell a peer, tell somebody else about that memory. And as these, as these individuals are telling their happy memories, smiles are coming up, laughing is happening. So they took themselves from a place of 
stress and trying to follow my language and trying to understand what I was talking about doing something new to laughing and joking and feeling that joy that they had in that memory, whether it was from childhood or from last week. Um, and then we did the guided imagery. And again, you all can kind of close your eyes and, and imagine this. Um, so close your eyes and I want you to create a safe space, a place that's all yours. The stress can't get to you. The feeling of overwhelm can't get to you. There aren't deadlines, there aren't problems, there aren't demands, there aren't requests. Just take a couple of nice deep breaths and sit in that safe space. As you're in that safe space, look around. What do you see? What colors are there? What textures? Are there things or people? What do you smell? What can you taste? Is it a salty breeze on the air, grandma's cookies or something else? And what do you hear? All right, stand in that safe space, spin around, take it all in. This is your space. And then when you're ready, come back to the present moment. So clearly I would take a longer time doing that, but the idea being that they're creating a space that if they practice it enough, it's uh, self-care, especially using meditation is very similar to working out where it becomes muscle memory and you can get to it more quickly. Um, but people, then I had them draw their self space, their safe spaces, and they can hang them on their wall, which helps them get there more quickly and helps it feel more real. Um, yeah. And, it, and it, get, it got the same smiles. It got the same feeling of happiness because for most people, their safe space is a place tied to a memory. For those right. who have terrible memories, their safe space, a lot of kids I work with, their safe space is floating in the clouds that taste like chocolate. Um, yeah. because they have a real memory, but they can get that feeling of happiness and safety through that kind of imagery. Um, so in answer to your earlier question, I don't have a specific thing that gets people. They have to kind of try out the different things because one works for somebody, another doesn't, but it really is about um, being willing to try and try more than once. So the first time you do a safe space, the dogs barking in the background, the, the, you can smell the coffee next to you, you can hear um, people down the hall. And so it takes time to, to, to practice it. Um, so my only real suggestion for looking for self-care that works for you personally is try different things and try them a couple of times before you decide that it's not working for you and try them one at a time. Um, if you were to read my whole self-care workbook and do all 50 pages in one day, it's not going to help. It's going to feel really overwhelming. I like that. I like that a lot. You know, and even when I was doing it, I was thinking about something in my head and it was such a, you know, it was a, um, and it, uh, it was a moment where I was, when I was hiking, we had gotten to the top of the mountain and it was overlooking all the beautiful trees and some of the trees were changing colors and it was just the fresh, clean air and the quiet and the serene, you know, outlook. And it did bring me into like such a different space. You know, it brought me into a, a very peaceful, like getaway space, you know, like it took me out of the world that I'm in, you know, and just brought me to this really calm, peaceful environment that I was kind of sad to leave, you know, because it was so, you know, relaxing and, and, and so serene, you know, sometimes it's hard for people, I think, to get to that, find that peacefulness, you know, we were in a life, you know, you know, cause some people, you know, unfortunately we tend to remember the negative things more in life, more than we do the positive things. So when people say, you know, what are the good times you had? people can't remember a lot because they, they, they focused on all the negative things that had traumatic events in their, in their life. Yeah. Our brains are hardwired to do that. Actually. Um, we have a negativity bias that's just built into us uh, from some survival space where, you know, knowing where the negative things happened helped us live longer, helped us stay away from the people and the things that caused us harm. Um, in all reality, our brains just are not made 
um, they haven't evolved into the world that we live in right now, which I think is why we have to have all these conversations about self-care because we keep on talking about getting to a lower baseline. It's really hard to be at a low stress, no stress baseline in today's world when things are constantly coming at us. Like you, you can't turn on a TV or a radio without being stressed by the news out there and the expectations um, go beyond what our brain was initially created for. And our ability to evolve tech technology is much faster than our ability to evolve as a species. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. That's so true. And, and, you know, it's, I think it's so important to, you know, for people to get, take time to know who they are and, and understand, you know, what, what, you know, has significant meaning in their life, because a lot of people go through life and they have no idea, no clue what that you, what, you know, what meaningful things are, you know, within them and surround them. And I think that's so important, you know, to really understand who you are and, and what it means the most to you. That's actually one of my favorite, my personal favorite self-care activities. Um, and, and it really helps to, to push against burnout too. So when you think of burnout, burnout is feelings of emotional exhaustion, um, depersonalization or cynicism. So seeing others as not, as not another person. So in my space, seeing a, a client come in and be like, oh, another, another bipolar client, how can I deal with that? Instead of seeing them as a human being. Um, and yeah. then a feeling of reduced personal accomplishment. And so one of the approaches that I really like and that I find a lot of value in um, is doing a, a value sort, um, yeah. really getting an idea of what your personal values are. What are your motivating factors? Um, there's a lot of different ones that you can Google online. I like the ones that start with a huge list of different values and you whittle it down to 10, and then you whittle it down to five, and then you whittle it down to three. And I find yeah. it really interesting because I do this when I teach doctoral students too. Right. I do it with them. And my three change sometimes, um, mm -hmm. just depending on what's going on in my life and what I'm putting most of my energy into. Um, and, you, and you play mental math with yourself. You'll you know, you have family, friends, and meaningful relationships circled. And so you have to bring it down. You're like, oh, well, I'll just stick with meaningful relationships because it covers all the others. Um, yeah. But you come up with what are my three core values in this moment of time? And then you take it and you, and you do an inventory of your life. How am I living those values in my personal life and in my professional life? Where am I living the values and where am I not? Because where I'm not, that dissonance of living separate from what I value is where we start to feel that that sense of unease, that sense of not fulfilled living, that sense of depression or anxiety, um, and then making little tiny steps and little tiny goals. How can I live my purpose and my meaning and my my values more meaningfully and more purposefully? And it doesn't have to be changing your job. It might be, I'm working this job to pay the bills and to make it so I have time and, and resources to live these, these values. But if you can live your values purposefully in all of your decisions and in all of your day-to-day -day interactions, I guarantee you'll have less of a need for those self-care interventions because you'll wow. have that feeling of personal accomplishment because you're living your values. You won't feel as emotionally exhausted because you're getting some sense of, of success and of meaningful living. Um, yeah. And you're not going to feel depersonalized or cyn cynical because, again, your choices tie into what matters to you. And, so and that really comes, sorry, um, it yeah. comes from uh, Viktor Frankl, um, his uh, Man's Search for Meaning, I think it's called. Um, he was in... Uh, concentration camps and found a way to find purpose and meaning while being held in a concentration camp. And, and most of his existential therapeutic approach came from that experience of being able to find hope and value in a place where most people would say there's no such thing as hope and value. Right. So true. And I, I've heard many stories of, of people who have been, you know, in concentration camps or have told the stories, uh, you know, and they passed those stories on to other family members. And it was, you know, really 
finding that positivity, pulling out that, that, you know, you know, the things that brought joy to them, the things that brought happiness in their life and focusing on those things was what gave them the strength not to die. And, you know, I think it's so important that we also focus too, you know, you can tell me what you think on happiness and joy and manifesting that in our lives. Because if we don't focus on those two things as one of the top priorities in our life, you know, happiness and joy, you know, there's so many cases where even like you hear older people, you know, they are sickly and, and someone passes, you know, their spouse passes. And then shortly six months later, they pass. And you, you know, you hear many cases of people getting ill and passing, you know, because, you know, and they, they lack the happiness in their life. They lack that joy they found no purpose and, and they didn't have those core values and life just dwindled away because there was nothing for them to look forward to i think it really plays a role in our mind you know if we don't have purpose if we don't have core values if we don't have happiness in our life if we don't have joy in our life i think our life you know our bodies you know feel that and it breaks us down to the point where our bodies will slowly shut down you know what's your your intake on that yeah, I think this ties into some of those things, um, the mysteries of the brain still. Um, but finding joy every day is one of the one of the interventions that I suggest. Um, and again, it releases those endorphins. You remember that happy memory. You play a game with your child. You pet your dog. Anything that releases those feel good, happy endorphins trick your brain into thinking that everything's okay in that moment. And, and, and in doing that, you can now move forward into the same stresses that you had before, but move forward in a calmer baseline, which allows you to more effectively manage those problems. Um, and talking about um, the, as people age and the well-being, you know, we can't even begin to, to discount the power of those relationships, of those meaningful and purposeful relationships that bring joy, that bring um, a sense of, of fulfillment. Um, there have been multiple studies done, longitudinal studies done, that really explore that what the only variable that really ties to longevity of life is having meaningful relationships. Nothing mm -hmm. else, everything else is like small insignificant numbers, but the only variable that is significant is do they have long lasting, meaningful relationships? And again, talking about today's world and how our brain's not made for it, online friends are not meaningful relationships. Yeah. Following your favorite YouTuber is a meaningful relationship. Right. It's that face to face give and take relationship where both people are willing to sacrifice their time and some resources because they care about the other person. Right. I think that's so true. I, I think people get so um, techie in this world that, you know, they think that these things like social media and following their, their favorite YouTuber is going to, you know, fill those holes up and it, it doesn't fill up any hole. There is no common bond. There is no common ground with that individual. There are no emotions, you know, to that and ties to that individual. So how could you really have that true happiness and ha to have that, you know, manifest that joy, you know, it's just a filler, so to speak, just like the bathtub in a sense, yeah. you know, going into the bathtub so with your favorite essence mm -hmm. well they get they get that quick dopamine fix and so yeah. the the likes on internet um it's built almost like a drug where you get that yeah. quick high but the problem is just like a drug the drop takes you further down than your baseline so it's a quick high but yeah. you don't come back to like a baseline or a higher baseline like these self cares. You actually yeah. drop further down, and then you need another one. And it, and it is it plays out just like drug abuse and drug addiction does. Um, it, but it's a quicker high. It's a quicker yeah. happiness. Um, it's a that that immediate gratification that we're so used to. That online interaction has that, but it doesn't have that long lasting, purposeful, meaningful piece. Right. Exactly. Exactly. 
And and what would you suggest to people who are are really you know searching for you know there's so many people out there I hear too they're trying to find you know those 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 certain you know soul friends or soul partners and they you know it's really hard sometimes to find those meaningful relationships because they're not always easy to find you know people come and go in your life and you know sometimes you know finding a person that actually brings meaning and joy to your life is not always easy you know do you have any suggestions you know for that yeah so what i usually tell clients and what i do in my own life is lead with those values do something that involves other people um in that space of value so if you value um you know you you really value animals and their well-being go go volunteer at an animal shelter. I bet you will find somebody else that values the same things you do. Um, and and maybe a friendship can grow from there. But trying to find friends um, by going to places that don't mesh with your values, they're not going to be the people that you're looking for. Um, another thing, and this is really hard, um, and different people feel different levels of comfort with it, be willing to be vulnerable. It's really hard to make meaningful connections if everybody's staying on the surface and um, kind of protecting self, which again, it makes sense to protect self, especially in today's world where relationships are so fleeting. But if you're not willing to be real with the person across from you, you have no right to expect them to be real with you as well. So true. So true. I think I think that's the only way sometimes I think so many people are afraid to be vulnerable because they're afraid they're going to get hurt. So taking down those walls is very scary for a lot of people. And, you know, I think it's scary almost for everybody. But, you know, it's a chance you have to take if you want to build that relationship. And, and sometimes you will get hurt and it will be painful. But then you have to work through that pain and say, just, you know, this relationship was not what I expected or it was not it didn't end up where I wanted it to be but there's more people out there and eventually I shall find them, you know, and, and just really, you know, work with a positive mind. I feel like if we put positivity in our life, we can get through anything. It's when we focus on that negativity that destroys us. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's like, so when you focus on negativity, you're not even allowing yourself the opportunity to, to, to grow. Um, you're putting your own barriers up and, and yeah. most of us do it without even realizing we put those barriers up. It's a self-protective thing. It's an unconscious thing. Um, so that self-awareness piece, which is also a part of self-care, um, really knowing, getting to know yourself internally, getting to know, um, how do I feel when I'm content? Yeah. How do I feel when I'm not content? And I, and I think we throw happiness around a lot. And I think that um, our society has kind of made it seem like if you're not happy, then the world's bad and it's awful and you're depressed or anxious. The reality is happy is a fleeting moment. Like true happiness is not a sustainable place to be. But if yeah. you can be content, if you can sit in your space and be okay, that is the goal. And then the happiness, that's your baseline. And then the happiness are the ups and the stress is the down. But your baseline, if that can be content, you're winning. I love it. I love it. I, you know, it, and, and people have everyone's definition of happiness is different, too. And it's really, I think, figuring out what's your definition of happy? What is your definition of joy? You know, and then, you know, creating things that bring happiness into your life, create things that bring joy into your life, you know, and, and it's OK not to always think about please and everybody else, you know, let, let's, let's focus on you. You know, I had this discussion with an, a client of mine the other day, you know, and they kept going back in their relationship and they kept, you know, going back to, you know, their previous relationship, you know, their, their, their spouse. And I'm like, oh, well, what about you? What about you? You know, and because the, the love and the hurt was there, you know, and, you know, when you're, when you're married, you're always thinking about everybody else. You know, sometimes we lose fact of, you know, let's focus on us, you know, myself, yourself, let's focus on you. What do you need? What do you want? You know, what's going to make you happy? 
you know, and, and really focusing on yourself. I, Cause I think if people started to focus on themselves and give themselves self-love, not only will they, they have joy and they'll manifest happiness in their life and in their life can really transform, but they could actually grow more independent. They could become stronger. Their self-esteem will, will, you know, develop. And, and, and once that self-esteem thrives, I think there's no turning back. If you could keep working on your self-esteem on a daily basis, once you get confident, and who you are and you become, and that's when the independence comes. That's when you really start to look at yourself as long as you don't get lost in life and you keep going back and figuring out, like you said, what are your core values? What are your core needs? You know, and really keeping in tune because we do change too, you know, and I think that's what we have to also be aware of too, is that, you know, we, as people, we, every couple of years or so, we do change, you know, they always joke around about the seven year change, but we do change as, as we get older. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that in different families and different societies, um, different cultures, there are different, differing expectations about how much value there is to giving to others. And what I find is um, if you go into giving, with an understanding in your own mind of here's how much I'm willing to give without expecting anything in return, that you don't get lost, that you don't lose your sense of self, that you don't feel burnt out. It's when you give and give and give um, with an unspoken expectation to get something in return that it becomes um, problematic in life. Uh, you know, for a lot of us, some of our values and our purpose does come from giving back. Um, but I have found, like I said, that if you give with that expectation, spoken or not, that you get something back, you're never going to find that contentment. You're never going to find that happiness or that purpose because the purpose wasn't actually giving. It was being seen as a giver. Um, yeah. And so really, again, it, it all boils back to that self-awareness because while there's that change every seven years, there's also trauma changes, re rewires the brain, um, certain experiences cause us to respond in certain ways. And oftentimes our unconscious response to things is related to experiences as experiences that we've had in the past. Um, and we're not even thinking about it, but our brain is like, oh, I know what happens here, do this. And so if we slow down and we take the time to think about wow, this kind of pattern in my life is not working out super well for me. What yeah. is going on? And you just think through, when did this pattern start showing up? How does it play out? What do you do in it? Um, you can start to catch moments that can be adjusted and that can be changed, but that requires your brain to be like this, which yes. requires you to learn how to keep yourself at that stable, um, even flow of emotional reactivity. And most of us, aren't super conscious of the fact that we're losing our emotional um, regulation until after the fight already happened. And we're like, oh, I lost it there. Yeah. And I think that happens to a lot of people is they don't realize until they really hit that, you know, survival, that flight mode. And, and then it's like, wait, you know, what's going on, you know, and it's like a highway with six lanes and like, where do I turn, you know, but we don't want to get to that point. So, you know, in, in, in your, in your point of view, how do you refrain from getting to that point of view where it doesn't get so extreme to the point where when you finally hit rock bottom, that's when you realize there's a problem when you're totally burnt out or you're totally lost in life or emotionless in life because you're just so overwhelmed, you can't even focus, you know, how do we stop ourselves from not getting to that point like where we could actually become so in tune with our bodies that we know exactly when the littlest thing is out of whack? Yeah. So the best way to do it is to catch it before you hop onto that six lane highway, because the way you explained that is perfect. That's how our brain works. Um, you know, neurons fire once they hit a certain action potential, and then it is a train that rushes and there's nothing you can do to stop it until it's done with that, that process. And so the more that you engage in a certain response, the faster you hit that action potential and the quicker the, the end result happens. So you yeah. want to get off before you hit that highway. 
Um, and again, that goes back to the self-care. We all have tells. We all have things happening in our body that lets us know that we're getting stressed out. Um, for me, if I start biting the back of my cheek or my tongue goes back to the back of my, my back teeth, I know I'm feeling frustrated or irritated or something's happening. Usually I don't even know what, but I know if, I, if I'm sitting like that, there's a problem. Um, for right. some of us, it's the heart racing. For some of us, it's immediately having negative thoughts about ourselves, um, hands clenching. So it's some sort of bodily or thought process response and it's yeah. different for everybody, but it's, right. it's that warning sign that we're about to jump onto that six lane highway. And that's when we do those self-care things. That's when we go to that safe place. That's when we, for me, walking outside is a huge bring down. If I just took the time when I'm feeling that way to just step outside on the porch for like two minutes, I can yeah. come back in calm. If I don't catch that moment, then I'm yelling at the kids or I'm straight into the negative self-talk and plummeting in my, my ability to manage my own stress and my own stressors. Right. That's so true. That's so true. I, I think that's like, uh, you know, it's so important to really understand, like, you know, as soon as you find that little, you know, it, you know, really acknowledge yourself and really pay attention. And as soon as you see yourself doing that, that's when you, you stop. And it's like that, and then you have to really give yourself some self-care and, 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 you know, and then don't worry about everything else. Everything else will get done because like, you know, I think we have to always realize and always remind ourselves that, you know, if we can't take care of ourselves, then we can't take care of others. So we really have to put ourselves first and throw out the guilt and throw out the shame because it's really, how are you going to take care of everybody when you can't even take care of yourself and to really understand who you are and those little signs and symptoms, as soon as they come, that's when you go into your self-care mode and you start, you know, really exemplifying the things that, you know, will bring peace and serenity in your life. Yeah. And I, I think that, like anything, um, you know, I always think that t doing the dishes is going to take me like two hours of my life. Um, I think a lot of people think that about self-care too, that oh, I don't have time for self-care. I have to do this, this, and this. But the reality is 30 seconds is enough to reset from here back to here. It's when we're all the way done that it takes us longer to reset. But if we can catch ourselves right. as it's starting to go up, we, 30 seconds is enough, just a couple of deep breaths, just a quick grounding activity, a quick visit to that, uh, to that safe space. And that's enough for us to just continue on with our day if we catch it early enough. Um, I actually participated in a, in a study. It, we, we never published it, which is probably a bad call on our part. Um, but we looked at, we did a meta-analysis of burnout interventions in the helping professions. So, um, doctors, nurses, teachers, etc. And we found that there is no statistically significant um, change in burnout levels when these interventions occur. And the reality is it's because they're occurring too late. Burnout yeah. interventions don't work, as you were noting, after you already were on that six lane highway, you're already burnt out. There's no fixing it when you're all the way up here. Um, yeah. And so it really does, like the research supports it anecdotally, um, our stories support it, that you've got to find a way to catch it early. And when you don't, because we, none of us are perfect, and we will always end up on that six lane highway. It's the, it's the, what do you do when you come down, when you calm down? Most of us, when we calm down, we just wipe our hands and are like, oh, not going to let that happen again. Um, yeah. But we don't actually break it down and think to ourselves, where could I have taken a moment to remove myself from that situation or to take 30 seconds to calm down? What were the warning signs or the triggers that I missed? Is this a pattern? Because again, we all have certain things that set us on that pathway way faster. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of parents I work with, it's disrespect. Even for me, sometimes it's the, the disrespect that I um, mm -hmm. see coming out of my children. But the reality is, my definition of disrespect and their definition of disrespect are two different things, but right. I take it as they mean to be that disrespectful. And so do the parents I work with. Um, yeah. And so catching that and, and trying to understand it and, and talking about it with whoever I got upset with 
um, when everybody's calm to try to find those turnoffs before that six lane highway. Right. You know, I, I think I think it's really important to, you know, um, work on yourself all the times, you know, and, and I see that, too, with a lot of doctors and a lot of healthcare, um, you know, uh, people that they they are they work so hard and they're just not aware of those triggers because they're so focused on their patients and then they have to go home to their families and then they're trying to make up because a lot of them work long hours and stressful hours so they're trying to make up for the time they haven't spent and it's it's the last person they're always thinking about is themselves until they really one day they just sit down and they're just I totally burnt out, you know, like, I don't want this, you know, and, you know, a lot of people in the healthcare industry feel like that. They just, they lose track of themselves so easily because it's always worried about the patient, worrying about the family, worrying about the employees, worrying about the staff members, you know, and where do they come in? Yeah. It's a, so all the helping professionals, uh, they're so heavy on the emotional output and the emotional resources necessary to do the job um, that you can't just, it's hard to just turn it off. It's not that you can't, but it's hard to leave work at work, especially yeah. in today's world where people can email you or text you at any point. And there's this unspoken expectation that you respond. And so healthy boundaries is another self-care piece yeah. uh, that is hard to do, but very helpful if you can figure out how to do it. Um, yeah. But, but the fact that you can't turn it off, the fact that a lot of the skills and strategies that you use with patients, you're also having to use in your interpersonal relationships. And as yeah. a parent, it, it wears on you differently than just going in and um, working a normal nine to five job that yeah. requires maybe some interaction with people, but it doesn't require you showing up in a genuine vulnerable way at all times. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now tell me a little bit more about your workbook. Now you're, you're in the process of working on it and completing it. Um, tell us a little bit about it and when we, when you expect to have it out. Yeah. So I was trying to get it all done for that group in Uganda. And so I got the, I got the whole first half done. Um, so what it'll be is a workbook and a planner with weekly prompts. And what I did was I just pulled different self-care resources from all over the place. So some of them I don't personally like or find helpful, but I know other people do. And some I love and I use them regularly and I know other people will hate them. Um, mm -hmm. Again, very individualized. Um, but I start with kind of the intervent, like the the baseline stuff, the how do you have that healthy living? How do you set up your life in such a way that you are um, centering well-being and just your day-to-day -day way of living? There's a part in it where you assess yourself in different types of self-care, um, different realms of self-care. And then it gets into the more targeted interventions. Okay, you're feeling stress. Here's different things you can do. Um, I'm trying to remember how many sections. I think there's about 12 or 13 sections. And each section has a, a little blurb about how that particular approach, like finding joy or um, like living your values, how that approach um, impacts your brain and your well-being. So, so it gives you a little bit of the science behind why we do this. And then yeah. each section has two to three activities for you to try out um, under that larger heading um, mm -hmm. with the idea that you slowly try on different ways of self-care, different ways of well-being and find the ones that work for you. And then, so that part's done. Um, the second part is more of a planner, a way for you to set yourself goals for each week. Again, I don't want you doing the whole book all at one time. Pick a section, pick a activity, and, and focus on that for the week. It'll have journal prompts each week, um, and it'll just be kind of an all-inclusive, let's try on different ways of self-care so that by the end of this six months or this year, however long you want to try it, you have an idea of which ones work best for you and have hopefully practiced those ones enough that that muscle memory is there. Oh, I love it. I love it. And when did you say again, this will probably be out? I'm hoping to have it on my website um, 
fully uh, within the next three months. I'm thinking I might just post what I have so far for people to be able to, to at least use the, the workbook part. Um, yeah. So I just have to go through and make sure that it's all ready to post. So that should be up in the next two weeks. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, if you had to take everything that we talked about today and you wanted to summarize some important aspects of our conversation, what would be some things that you'd like to emphasize? I think the most important thing, and also honestly the hardest, is that self-awareness piece, really getting to know yourself and where your turnoffs are for that high, for that highway. Um, if you can do that, then you can pick and choose from all, many different self-care activities, um, but you have to be able to use it at the right time. And so self-care is step number one. I love it. I love it. And can you tell everybody about the different services that you offer? Yeah, so through my website, which is apoclarponders.org, um, I provide consultation as needed. There's a lot, there's several different resources available for free about how to talk to your child about difficult things, how to manage your own emotional reactions to things. Um, I'll be posting the workbook up there. I try to keep a blog, but I'm not very good at it. So there will be occasional <laughs> blog posts from me. Um, I also provide um, psychological assessment for kids. So if that's something that you're interested in, or um, I review assessment results from other providers and give you a better understanding of what those results mean. Um, yeah. But really anything to help with parenting, feel free to reach out to me and we'll figure it out. Um, and then on the nonprofit side, I work with an organization called uh, Sentinel Foundation. Their website is foundationsentinel.org. And they focus on um, child sex trafficking and child sexual exploitation. So if there are concerns about your child's safety, about navigating online spaces, navigating those kinds of conversations with your child, feel free to reach out through there as well. I love it. And can you tell everyone one more time what your website is so they don't forget it? Apoclarponders.org. I love it. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashley, for coming on the show today and sharing this information. I think this is something that a lot of people really need to hear because a lot of times, you know, people look at self-love and they look at self-care. And like you said, they Google all these different little easy steps, but it's really about going deep down inside yourself and making some significant changes within and really practicing those changes and, and making it a part of your life. And it, it goes a little deeper than what a lot of people see on on the internet. So thank you so much for sharing those things and, and really, you know, emphasizing them on the show. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the space to do so. Yes. And, and everybody, um, I just want you to know that Dr. Ashley has a podcast on our site. So you could look up her, her podcast and she has all her episodes on there. She has amazing episodes and you could just look up her name, Dr. Ashley Pokler and all her podcasts that she's done previously will pop up as well as this one. So thank you so much, Dr. Ashley, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.